Good morning. <laughs> Man, I've been away so long. It feels weird being back. Um, I, I'm thrilled, by the way, to be back. It was really good having time off, but um, I, I love this. I mean, I love being with you guys. I love what God allows me to do. So I'm um, thrilled to be back with you. And I knew you 8.30 people wouldn't have any problem. Uh, 9, 8.30, it's all the same. You're early birds. doesn't matter at all. So um, anyway, thank you for being with us. Well, we're starting a new series, but to get the thought track, uh, Kim had just read a verse to you, and I want to start by kind of backtracking on that. It's where it says in Matthew 9.35, it says, Then Jesus went throughout all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the good news of the kingdom, and healing every kind of disease and sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were bewildered and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Now, the simple idea we have here is that crowds were coming to Jesus. And when you read the Gospels, you see this as a regular phenomenon for his entire three-and-a-half-year ministry. Everywhere Jesus went, he drew massive crowds. People would literally be crushing in on him. And the question I like to start us with thinking is, why did people come to Jesus in these crowds? Uh, Let's ask it in a slightly more pertinent way for us today. Why did you come here this morning? Why do people come to places like churches anytime, anywhere? Well, why did the people come to Jesus? I think the simple answer to the question is just this. People came to Jesus because all things considered, they were hoping for, they wanted a better quality of life. And they thought that somehow Jesus might be the key to them having a better quality of life. If they were sick, they wanted to be healed. If they were confused, they wanted to have clarity. If they were directionless, they wanted direction. If they weren't sure about what God was like, they wanted to know what God was like. If they weren't sure what was going on in their lives in the world, they wanted to know. And Jesus provided all that. People came to Jesus in crowds because they simply were looking for something to improve the quality of their life. And people come to churches all over America, all over the world, every Sunday, each and every one of you in some way, you are here because you're at least hoping there might be some chance that something will occur, something will be said that might actually make a significant improvement in your life. And some of you are sitting there saying, no, that's not why I came, man. I was forced to come today. Yeah. <laughs> Aside from you that were forced maybe, just maybe, something beneficial will come to you as well. Now, Thomas just finished a series last week, and uh, it was called Above the Line, and it, it emphasized the critical importance for spiritual growth to become aware of what is going on inside of us. And one of the main points in the series was this, that when we live above the line, we're living from a place of knowing that we're accepted by God and loved by God. And when we walk through life knowing we are accepted by God and loved by God, this furnishes us inwardly with a differing kind of a capacity to behave in more positive ways. And so I want to start this series by asking a question, is it possible that if we're living life above the line, if we're living from that place of acceptance with God and knowing that we're loved by God, is it possible that there might be one common, even though there's multiple manifestations of this, is it possible that there might be one common manifestation that is a solid proof that we are living above the line, living from that place of God's acceptance and God's love? And and I want to suggest to you that Jesus gives us that model. People came to Jesus because they were convinced he was available. He would serve them from morning until evening. And they knew that he liked doing so, that he cared, that he was a ready servant. He chose to serve them. He chose to use his powers to benefit them and help them. They knew. They were confident They could come to Jesus, and he would be delighted to serve them. 
Folks, people ought to be able to come to any local church in America, any local church in the world, and they ought to know that there are people there so full of the Spirit of Jesus that they can be confident that the people there are servants. The number one proof manifestation that human beings are living above the line, living from that place where they know they're accepted by God and loved by God, those human beings will be found like Jesus. They will be found to be servants. They'll be found to be a different kind of a people, a kind of a person that goes through life not saying, what are you going to do for me? What am I going to get out of this? How am I going to profit from this? How am I going to benefit? That's okay at a certain level in life. We all need that. But the people that have been influenced by the love of God, they know they're accepted by God, they know they're loved by God, they go through life typically living above the line, asking a different set of questions. When they meet people, when they meet situations, when they're at work, when they're in their neighborhood, when they're in their homes... They ask this question, maybe not consciously, but it's always playing in the background. What can I do for you? How can I help to meet what God determines are your greatest needs? Is there some way I can serve you today, right now? Is there some way I can help? Is there some way I can be a blessing to you? What can I give you? It is a very different frame of mind. Most folks unconsciously are, what am I going to get out of this? What are you going to give me? What are you going to do for me? But the person above the line is characterized by what I'm going to call activistic servanthood. Activistic servant. Jesus didn't just serve in theory. He actually served. And when you and I are united to Jesus, living above the line, full of the awareness of his acceptance and love, I'm telling you, you can take it to the bank. You will be, I will be found with a servant's heart, just like Jesus. Now, some of you, I know you're right, right away, you're hearing, hearing this, you're saying, oh, man, my goodness, man, I'm already so overwhelmed in life, and I'm broken, and I'm confused, and I can hardly put one foot in front of another. Just, just relax, just relax. There's a place for that. You're here to be served. That's cool. That's good. But there are many of us that God is now getting ready to take us to a different place, to a different level. He wants to stir us. He wants to challenge us. He wants to put us on a path that's going to lead to a kind of a development that we can hardly imagine, but it's going to call for activistic servanthood. Let's look at a portion of Scripture from the Gospel of Matthew. It will be page 1116 in those Bibles near you on the chair. Matthew chapter 20 is where you'll be. And when you come to Matthew 20, we're going to pick up in verse 17. But to give you some context, these, this passage occurs in the last months of Jesus' life. He's just months away from going to the cross. And he knows this, and he is trying to prepare his disciples, his first followers, to be ready to take over his servant ministry. So with that in mind, let's pick up reading in chapter 20, verse 17. It says, as Jesus was going up to Jerusalem, he took the twelve aside privately and said to them on the way, Look, we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be handed over to the chief priest and the experts in the law. They will condemn him to death and will turn him over to the Gentiles to be mocked and flogged severely and, what is the word? Crucified. Crucified. Yet on the third day, he will be, you tell me, raised. raised. This is the third time now that Jesus has told his disciples, specifically told them in advance that he will be murdered. He will be beaten. He will be killed. He will be rejected by the religious leaders. But he always says the same thing. He always says, but on the third day after my death, I'll rise again. This is his third prediction. He's just months away from the event actually occurring. Now, mind you, the gravity of this. They're headed for Jerusalem. It's the final destination for Jesus. It's where he will be crucified. The gravity that this must have had on the hearts of the disciples hearing this. But look at what happens next. Let's pick up reading in verse 29. Excuse me, verse 20. It says, Then the mother of the sons of Zebedee came to him with her sons, and kneeling down, she asked him for a favor. He said to her, What do you want? 
She replied, permit these two sons of mine to sit one on your right hand and one on your left in your kingdom. Jesus answered, you don't know what you're asking. Are you able to drink the cup I'm about to drink? He was talking about his sacrificial suffering that would occur when he was crucified. He told them, you will drink my cup, but to sit at my right and my left is not mine to give. Remember, it is for those whom it has been prepared for by my Father. Now look at the reaction of the rest of the disciples. Now, when the other ten heard this, they were, what is the word? Angry with the two brothers. But Jesus called them and he said, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them and those in high position use their authority over them. It must not be this way amongst you. Instead, whoever wants to be, what is the word? Great. There's nothing wrong with wanting to be great. Whoever wants to be great among you must be your, and let's say it together, your servant. Greatness is available to every person sitting in this room today. You see, Randy, you don't know me, man. You don't know me. You don't know my life. You don't know what I've done. You don't know where I'm at right now. You don't know how broken I am. You, you don't know how without talent and skill and ability. I'm telling you, as you sit here today, the living God who loves you, who has known you from your birth and has watched you without ever losing attention on you, he is telling you today, he is literally calling you today, rise up. And be the great soul, the great person. Live the great life. Etch history differently by your greatness. And it's all within your hands. If you're willing to be a servant. That's what he's saying to all of us. Servanthood in theory is not servanthood. It takes activistic servanthood. So he says to them, he says, whoever wants to be first among you must be your slave. Just as the Son of Man, speaking of himself, did not come to be what? He didn't come to be served. Jesus didn't come to be served. But to what? Sir, is, is, is this road the only ones that are watching the Bible? <laughs> but to serve and to give, at least that kid gets it, and to give his life as a ransom for many. So Jesus flips the values of society upside down. Now, I think that Jesus' followers then had a problem with the notion of servanthood and greatness because their images of what a servant was were kind of skewed just as our images today tend to be skewed. And we think of being a servant as being denigrating or being, take advantage, being taken advantage of or things of that notion. And when we think of greatness, we, we think of things like this, you know. We think of people like her. I mean, this lady, from the time she gets up in the morning until she goes to sleep, she pretty much doesn't do anything except blink her eyes and move her feet a little bit. People do everything for her. I don't want to get too, too direct, but everything is done for her. We think of that as greatness. The greater you are, the more people cater to you and do things for you. The, the notions we have of being a servant are kind of like this next picture. We, we, we think of, you know, being like a butler and a maid, and, and it's kind of denigrating. And so we back off a little bit from being served, and we go through life wanting to be served. But Jesus says, no. He says, no. He says, greatness is the person who says to everyone in every situation in life, what can I do? How can I help? What can I give you? How can I serve you? Because it takes a lot of capacity, a lot of unselfishness, a lot of love to do that. So he flips the image of greatness all around. So we want to we start by just understanding the servant's value. This series is going to be about servanthood, but don't let that scare you. Let's start by trying to understand the value. And Jesus says, real greatness, it's the person who selflessly serves and lives to serve others. The book of Philippians talking about Jesus gives us emphasis on this again. The apostle Paul writing to followers of Christ living in Philippi. He says, indeed, let this attitude be in you. We're to have the attitude if we're a Christ follower. He says, let this attitude be yours if you're a Christ follower, which was also in Christ Jesus, though he was by nature, what? God, Jesus is God. 
He did not consider equality with God as a prize to be displayed. He didn't show his full-blown blinding glory. It goes on to explain. But he emptied himself by taking the nature of a what? If servanthood was good enough for Jesus, if a life of activistic servanthood, of tireless servanthood, was good enough for Jesus... Isn't that suggestive, at least? Let this attitude be in you that was like in Jesus. He took, he took the nature of a servant when he was born in human likeness and his appearance was like that of any other man. So here we have this strong emphasis that just as Jesus served, so we too should serve. And the notion is this, that the greater a person is, the greater serves the lesser. The stronger serves the weaker. And we know this. We know this in our better moments. I mean, most of us own dogs. Yeah, let me just see your hand. You're a dog owner? Dog owner? Okay. Does your dog make you dinner or do you make your dog dinner? Right? <laughs> do you scoop your dog's poop or does... No, no forget that. That's a, bad, that's a bad... But you get my point. You're greater than the dog, but you serve the dog. Most of us in here have babies. You know, the first, first year of a baby's life, you go through about 100 messy diapers a week. Why do you go through the 100 messy diapers a week? Is it because you just, you just love to the feel and the smell of messy diapers? It's euphoric. Uh, could, could it be that someone is secretly paying you a million dollars a year to change 100 messy diapers a week? Uh, could it be that you fear that the tiny little creature has superpowers and may come back on you if you don't say no you serve that baby tirelessly deprived of sleep often because you are the greater and you love this child you're love motivated love always did get follow me now love love always shows itself in activistic servanthood what do you mean activistic servanthood servanthood that can be seen where am i serving who am i serving how am i serving do i indeed walk through life with those questions going through my how can i help you what can i give to you what how can i bless you that's activistic servanthood it needs to be concrete there's another thing about being a servant. It's branded. It's branded into your heart, into your image. In the book of Genesis, chapter 1, verse 27, it says this. It says, God created humankind in whose image? His own image. The image of God, he created them, male and female. He created them. You're made in the image of God. And we just saw that God is a servant. He's the greatest servant in the universe. He lives to serve those he created because he loves Therefore, inside of you, inside of me, there's this nature that's just waiting to be developed, to be a servant. It's your image. They, they found studies. Now, there, there's a scientific study that says this. Science says helping others makes us happier. It turns out that helping others, volunteering to help an organization, a colleague or a friend, offering to help not only makes you feel good, it is good for you. It can help you live longer and happier. They, they found in this study, it's interesting, you read it, that when you serve, you have a release of endorphins, and it's kind of like you've heard of the runner's high. Well, they call it the servant's high. It's literally almost like a low-grade morphine high that you get when you serve. Why? Why is that so? Because you're made in the image of God. Let me be more clear. You are not your true self you are not who you were meant to be you are not who you can be you are not the great soul that God intended you to be until you're an activistic service are you actively serving somewhere someone because it's your nature it's who you are it's where you'll find yourself it's where your deepest fulfillment 
will be discovered. Anytime we align our lifestyle, knowingly or unknowingly, with our nature, we maximize the quality of our life. We maximize our fulfillment. You were made, I was made to be a servant. I'm made in the image of God. When I serve, I find joy, I find peace, I find fulfillment, I find meaning, I find satisfaction. Listen, that I can't find by doing anything else, getting anything else, achieving anything else. You can take it to the bank. Some of you know the truth of this already. I'm going to give you four critical points about servanthood to show you how valuable it is, why it is so valuable. Here we go. Servanthood is the highest level of human development. Jesus said the greatest is the servant. The the higher our development, the more Christ-like we become, the more will our capacity to service, service be. Not only that, it's the way of development. What what do I mean by the way of development? I mean this. If you and I don't serve, we will not develop. We will not grow. You can study the Bible until it blows your ears off your head. You will not, I will not grow until I am serving. Serving is the way of development. The more I serve, the more I can serve. The more my capacity increases to serve, the more joy, the more delight I have in it. Secondly, servanthood is necessary for the highest levels of personal happiness. Your personal happiness, the highest levels, there's nothing else you can bring, the highest levels of personal happiness like serving and becoming a servant can because you're made in the image of God. Third, servanthood is necessary for the highest levels of societal happiness. Societies cannot reach the maximum level of happiness, joy, whatever you want to call it, until people are serving one another as a norm. That's the way the world was meant to work, that everywhere you go, everybody you meet, they're asking the question, how can I bless you? How can I serve you? What can I give you? And you're asking the same question back. And the whole world is meant to function that way. Servanthood will be, the uni- will be universal in the eternal future. When Christ returns and he makes a new heaven and a new earth, the entire universe for all the rest of eternity, everybody in the universe will be a servant and we will all serve one another for eternity and that's what will make eternity so wonderful so this gives us a sense of what the value of servanthood is but the problem is this that I can know the value of servanthood I can even internalize the value of servanthood but it will not be unleashed in my life it will not be unleashed in your life until it's activated somehow it's just a it's just a pleasant theory it's just a bible truth it's just a point of doctrine that I tuck away. So let me take you right back to that scripture that we started with earlier today that Kim shared and then I went back to Matthew chapter 9 verse 35. It says, Then Jesus went throughout all the towns and villages teaching in all their synagogues. So one of the ways that Jesus served people was he taught them the truth about God, the truth about life. He preached to them the truth about God, the truth about life. And then it says, He was teaching and preaching in the synagogues the good news of the kingdom And healing every kind of disease and sickness. I don't have the power to heal every disease and sickness, but I do have the power to do certain things for people. Jesus did this. It goes on. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them. He cared because they were bewildered. They didn't know who they were. They didn't know what they were doing. They didn't know what the purpose of life is. They didn't know where they were going. They they didn't know that there was any solution for the difficulties that humanity faced. They were helpless. They couldn't solve their disease problems. They couldn't solve their relational problems. They couldn't solve their personal problems any more then than we can solve ours now as a society or individually on our own. Jesus saw them like sheep without a shepherd. They needed direction. They needed guidance. They needed protection. They needed to be nurtured. They needed to be fed on the truth. They needed the shepherd of their souls, their creator, Jesus. It goes on. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is, just like a song we sang, the harvest is what? Plentiful. But the what? The workers are are few. What did he mean by the harvest? The harvest were people that are just saying, man, I know there must be more to life than this. I want more to life. I need help, and I am willing to come to Jesus to seek help. That, those are harvestable souls. The people that are wanting more and willing to come to Jesus, come to church to at least see if there might be more. There might be solutions. 
Those are harvestable souls. He says they're plentiful, he was telling his disciples. The men, get the picture, the crowds were thronging him. They were all around him. He was serving them from morning till evening. He's saying the people are, are, are ready to be harvested. You know, fruit, when it's ready to be harvested, is a critical stage. It's in a developmental stage all up in that place. But once it's ready to be harvested, it needs to be taken quickly or it starts to spoil. It starts to deteriorate. It starts to rot. Jesus is saying when human beings come to that place where they are open and ready to find solutions for life in God, that that's a critical juncture that, that if they're not brought in, if they're not taken out of their environment and brought to Jesus, that their lives will quickly start to deteriorate and become hopeless. And so it's critical that they are brought to Jesus. But, but Jesus says the problem is there's, there's not enough workers. It, it's like having 100 acres of corn and you only got two people picking it with their hands. It, it's a problem. The harvest is plentiful. The harvest is ready. But there are not enough workers, said Jesus, not me. He said it. And then he says this. He says, therefore, ask the Lord of the harvest to send out what? Workers, workers into his harvest. And what is harvest? Harvest are people. They're just saying, man, there's got to be more of the life than this. And, and, and I, I want more of the life than this. And I am willing to even go to Jesus and see if he has the solution. Workers. Workers are needed, he says, for the harvest. So you can't help but to feel a little uncomfortable because the question seems to be unavoidable, doesn't it? That... that you, I, I have to ask myself, am I available to Jesus? Am I one of his workers? Am I someone that he can count on to partake of the harvest? I'm going to ask you a question. This is participatory. Participatory. How many of you that are here this morning, ever in your life you've had somebody talk to you in some way about Jesus, maybe they were just sharing with you about what's going on in their life and how they started going to church or how they started reading the Bible or whatever, but they, they started a conversation with you somehow, something about Christ in some way, and maybe they also invited you to church. How many have ever had that happen to you before, before you finally started coming to church yourself? Can I just see your hands? Oh, that's good. You know what? I'm going to ask you to do something really creepy. Will you stand up? All of you just raise your hands. Will you just stand up? And I want you to look around at yourself. Stand up. Stand up. All of you raise your hands. Stand up. Look around. Go ahead. Look around you. The harvest is ripe. You were harvested because somebody talked to you about Christ. Because somebody invited you to church. Somebody was a servant. You go ahead and sit down. I'm sorry. You, you see, it's all theoretical. Until, <laughs> until I say, I'm your servant, Lord. I'll go where you want me to go. I'll talk to who you want me to talk to. I'll do what you want me to do. You see, harvesting a human, it's not like harvesting an ear of corn. To harvest a human, you have to go to them. You have to talk to them. You have to say something to them about Christ, about your personal experience. You have to invite them to move toward Jesus. And the easiest way to invite somebody to come toward Jesus for help in the elevation of the quality of their life today is to invite them to church because that's where they can sit and soak in truth and consider which direction they want their life to go in. But that only happens when there are more workers, when there are more people that are talking to others about Christ, where there are more people that are inviting others to church. God's always wanted the same thing from his people. Listen to this verse from Deuteronomy. This is way back when God had just led the Israelites out of their Egyptian bondage and they were, they were getting ready after 40 years wandering in the wilderness, ready to go into the land of promise. And God reminds them, he says, people of Israel, he says, what does the Lord your God want from you? The Lord wants you to respect and what? Follow him. To love and? Serve. Notice how love and service go together. It's meaningless to say I love Jesus and not serve Jesus. It's meaningless to say I love Jesus and not serve people. God's always want the same thing. 
with all your heart and with all your soul. God wanted people to come to the place where they saw his goodness. They trusted him so much that this is the result. He says, I want people to finally see who I am. And when they see who I am, I know they'll respect me. I know they'll want to follow me. They'll know I love them more than they love themselves. They'll know that I know what's best and want what's best. They'll follow me fully, freely, forever. And they'll love me when they see how much I love them. And the result will be they'll live above the line and they will serve. They'll serve me, and serving God always means serving others. Always, always, always. There's a couple interesting studies that were done. Um, it's a book called The Other 80. In the book, The Other 80%, researchers Scott Thuma and Warren Bird state that most churches, this is shocking, most churches are actually run by 20% of the congregation. The other 80%, they say, tend to act like, what is the word? spectators they are minimally involved 80 percent this is shocking now health the same book says healthy churches have about a 57 percent and up ratio of people that are actively serving i don't know what the percentage is in this church i'm curious about it but i know whatever it is i know it needs to grow because every church needs to grow until it's 100% of servants. All right, let me rephrase it. It ought to always be 80-20. Because you always ought to have 20 new people coming in that are just considering. And they need to be served. And the 80% of us ought to be serving them. That's the way it should work out. Now, this is not meant to make you feel guilty. This is not meant to put extra pressure on you. This is just meant to share truth with you. And perhaps allow God to call you to a different place than what you are in life today. So I want to do something in closing. I want to show you, well, first I want to show you a little chart real quick, if I can go to that. This is a fascinating thing. The Hartford Institute for Religious Research, it's taking all the churches in America, and this is what it says, that 59% of all the churches in America have either from 7 to 99 people in them. There's an additional 35% that only have 100 to 499 people. You add that together, I guess it's, what is it, 80 or, no, it's 95, no, 94% if you add that together. So 94% of the churches are under those numbers. And then you have 4% of churches in America that, that have 500 to 999 regular attendance. And then you have 2% of all the churches in America have 1,000 to, to 1,099. We fall into that 2% range. And then you only have 0.4% of churches that regularly average 2,000 to 9,999 uh, 9, and so forth. And then you have a 0 0.01 that are 10,000 above. Now, I'm not knocking small churches. I'm not saying that's a bad thing. Some, uh, sometimes the, the, the demographics uh, necessitate that a church is small. You know, you don't have a large population. But here's my suspicion. My suspicion is, is that churches are inordinately small across this country and across the world, not because of demographics, but because of what Jesus said. The harvest is plentiful, but the people... They care enough to be workers for God, inviters for God, communicators for God, are few. Are you a worker for God that he can count on for his harvest? I want to share a couple of the lyrics in this song, and we're going to, we're going to sing this song, the second part of it in just a minute. That's not the lyrics I want. Um, that was supposed to be deleted. <laughs> Can we find the lyrics I wanted? Okay, I'll just read them to you because I happen to have them. <laughs> what I wanted, okay, here we go. So take courage because it takes courage to go to other people and invite them to church. It takes courage to go to other people and tell them about what Christ is doing in your life. Lift up your voice. We have to speak. We have to identify ourselves as Christ followers because Jesus is alive. We shouldn't be fearful. There's a yes in our hearts that carries through eternity. Simple what? Obedience, Obedience changes what? Jesus wants you to be great. He wants us all to be great. He wants you to change your history, my history first, so that he can use us to change the histories of many, many other people. But you've got to be willing to do this. It's simple obedience. It's get out of the seats and get into the game and become a servant. Folks, 
I know some of you are thinking this way. You're thinking, man, I'm already overwhelmed. I'm already so beaten up and battered. I, and now you're going to put this extra burden on me. Please, if you're in that condition, you just, you just sit back and let us serve you. But I think some of us are kind of like the person that went to the doctor. This person goes to the doctor and they say, I am so tired all the time. I have no energy. I have no enthusiasm. I can hardly get up in the morning. All I want to do is sleep all day. I feel awful all the time. So the doctor runs an endless battery of tests on this person and they all come back fine. There's nothing wrong with you. There's nothing wrong with you. But the person says, you don't understand. I can't even hardly walk. I'm so weak. I'm so tired. And the doctor says, okay, I'm going to tell you what the solution is. Here it is. You're not going to like it, but here it is. You need to enlist in a vigorous exercise program, a progressive exercise program so that you are doing a little now and then more and more and more. And the person says, are you kidding me? It takes, it takes sleeping nearly all day just to be able to get up and do anything. And some of you feel that way. You feel like you, you can't do anything. You don't have any power. You don't have any ability. You don't have any time. You don't have any talent, whatever it is. And now this guy is putting this trip on me, this burden on me. No, you know the truth is the doctor was right. If that person will get up and start moving, start doing something, start exercising with progressive resistance, they will, instead of being weaker, they will get, you tell me, what is the word? Stronger. The God who loves you and created you in whose image you were made is saying, man, I see the greatness in you, but it's not going to happen until... You apply simple obedience. Become my servant. Let's pray. Father, I am doing just what you said. I am praying that you, Lord Jesus, Lord of the harvest, that you will stir every heart in this room and you will call them out and call us out to be your enthusiastic, compassionate-hearted, bold, courageous harvesting servant people forevermore. It's in Christ's name I pray. Amen.